When I came across this Lenovo desktop with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a quad-core i5 for only $40 on Facebook Marketplace, I jumped on the opportunity. But when I got home and opened it up, well, I realized there was definitely something wrong. Regardless, we're going to get this desktop cleaned up and see what it can do. Can this scam PC still be put to use? Or did I pay $40 for a pile of e-waste? Stick around if you'd like to find out. This is the Think Center E73 Mini Tower, which was released by Lenovo in 2013. These machines came in a variety of configurations using the 4th gen Intel CPUs. The system here was listed on Facebook Marketplace as having an i5-4570, which is a very solid quad-core CPU that I actually used in my personal rig for quite some time. The seller also stated that it had 16GB of DDR3 memory, and the entire system was listed for only $40. It should be obvious from the title and intro, though, that this is not the PC I would be receiving. So let me explain. I came across the listing and promptly messaged the seller, and we set up a time to meet. It normally would have taken me about 20 minutes to get there from where I live, but because of some bad traffic, it took me almost an hour longer than that. The seller seems pretty cool with that, and we eventually met up. Lenovo does this annoying OEM thing though of having screws holding the side panel on, and I didn't have a screwdriver, nor did I want to waste any more of this man's time, so I just trusted that all of the internal components were as described. Unfortunately though, I got home, opened it up, and immediately realized that the RAM slots were completely empty. And this is where it gets weirder. I messaged the seller who actually apologized and said something about having to ask his son about it. He said he would try to get the RAM and meet up with me at some point, which I took as just being an honest mistake, which it might well have been. Because I wanted to make sure that the system worked though, I tossed in some DDR3 I had laying around and fired it up only to discover that the CPU in this machine was actually an i3-4160. When I messaged the seller to ask about this, he immediately left the conversation, which with how Facebook Messenger apparently works, means he basically just vanished. This was all very confusing to me. Why would he message me back in the first place if he knew he was trying to rip me off? It makes me think that he actually did make a mistake and there was some sort of mix-up, and by the time we got to the issue also being with the CPU, he kind of just gave up and didn't want to deal with it anymore. Whether it was intentional or not, I still got scammed, and I need to do a better job of verifying purchases whenever I meet up in person. And I'm hoping that this video can be a lesson so something similar doesn't happen to you. Even though this isn't the system I paid for, I decided that it would still be worth seeing what my $40 got me. The motherboard in this E73 has an LGA 1150 socket and officially supports up to an i7-4770. It has adequate rear I.O. for a pre-built, with VGA and Display ports for use with integrated graphics, as well as two USB 3.0 ports and Gigabit Ethernet. The motherboard is relatively expandable with three SATA ports, a full-length PCIe Gen 3 slot, and two by one PCI Gen 2 slots. There are only two slots for DDR3 memory, but that's to be expected with most systems like this. So far, this motherboard looks pretty solid, but you might have noticed the weird power connectors. Lenovo, at least around this time, used strange proprietary connectors rather than standard 20 or 24 pin ATX, which is incredibly frustrating. The 4 pin 12 volt power header is normal, but the motherboard power connector is a strange 14 pin connector. SATA power doesn't come from the PSU, but instead comes from a 4 pin header on the motherboard through this cable. Fortunately, there are cheap adapters if we decide to add in an ATX power supply but this means that the included 180 watt power supply is basically worthless outside this machine. The seller didn't mention any hard drives, but there is one 250 gigabyte drive as well as an 80 gigabyte drive. There's also a DVD drive as expected. I'm not a fan of calling things obsolete, but I really don't think that these drives are going to help us recoup our costs. The case isn't anything special and is honestly somewhat of a pain to work in, but it technically is still a case and at least has slots for two 3.5 inch drives, as well as cutouts for PCIe cards, which can't be said for every pre-built out there. So for $40, we got a case, a 180 watt power supply, a solid but weird LGA 1150 motherboard, and a dual core i3 that sells for around $20 on eBay. So maybe I wasn't scammed quite as bad as I originally thought. Before we test this out though, I wanna go ahead and get everything cleaned up. 
This machine wasn't incredibly dusty, and I honestly don't think it has been used that much recently. It did, however, seem like it has been sitting in storage for a while, as made evident by the dead bugs and other gross things in the case. I started out by removing the two hard drives, which were each held on by two screws, as well as the SATA and SATA power cables. Next, I popped off the front panel, which might be the dirtiest part of this entire case. After that, it was time to unscrew the only three screws holding in the DVD drive. I then finished removing the SATA, as well as this weird SATA power cable I mentioned earlier. The 180 watt power supply came out after removing the four screws, and then pushing it around a weird tab on the case. And then all we had left plugged into the motherboard at this point was the front I.O. like USB and audio cables down at the bottom of the motherboard. At this point, I could come back with a screwdriver and remove the screws holding in the motherboard, which was a lot more difficult since I didn't notice these nice little holes up here for a long screwdriver to fit through. After that, we could slide the motherboard out and see how dusty it really is. To solve that issue, I took an air compressor out on my back porch and tried to spray off all the big fuzz and dust that had accumulated on the motherboard, power supply, and other components. Then I came back with the soft brush to try to get everything else that the air compressor couldn't quite get. After that, I could go ahead and remove the front I.O. panel from the front of the case, as well as the power button. Then it was time to try to go ahead and get this case nice and cleaned up. The air compressor and rag worked pretty well for the chassis, but the front panel was a different story. It was pretty gross and needed the suds treatment. After that, I went ahead and took the rag and cleaner and wiped down the rest of the components and cables. Then we could move on to the motherboard. All we had to do here was remove the four screws holding on the heatsink, pull the heatsink off, and then use some isopropyl alcohol and a paper towel to clean up our CPU. Once it was cleaned up, I popped off the retention arm and took out our i3-4160. I used a Q-tip and some more isopropyl alcohol to try to clean up the rest of the thermal paste, put it back in the socket, and then came back one more time just to clean up any remaining thermal paste. Then I did the same thing for the bottom of the heatsink. Before reassembling everything, I went ahead and ran the power button cable, front I.O., as well as the cable for the speaker. Then we could drop in our motherboard and make sure it lined up with the I.O. shield on the back. This time, when I put the screws in, I took advantage of these two screw holes. Next, I put the proper amount of thermal paste and put our heatsink back on, securing it evenly with the four screws and then remembering to plug in the cable to the fan header. I kind of messed up putting the power supply and DVD drive in, and some of that kind of got cut off on camera. Then I went ahead and tried to run all of the front I.O. to the motherboard and clean up the cables as best as I could on camera. After I assembled everything, I came back and did a little bit more cable management, which you'll see later. Rather than using the mechanical hard drives, I took a 128 gig SSD and secured it using one screw. Very secure. Then I plugged in the SATA power connectors using the weird header on the motherboard, as well as the SATA cables. Then it was time to put the side panel on, as well as the front panel. And that's it. With everything all cleaned up, it was time to install Windows 10 and see how well this thing performed. Also, for all the Linux fans out there, yes, I know Linux would help this perform better. I'm aware, and I agree with you. But most people still prefer or need to use Windows 10 for various reasons. 
and most of my other general usage tests that I like to use for comparison have been using Windows 10. So hopefully we can go one video without someone telling me how dumb I am for using Windows. Tell me I'm dumb for other, much more valid reasons. Moving on. After hopping into the desktop, I was pleasantly surprised with how snappy this thing was. I was worried about this i3 only being a dual core, but it handles browsing windows, moving files, and other general tasks like a champ. Browsing the web was pretty snappy, and YouTube playback at 1080p was flawless, even using the newer VP9 codec. Using the handy dandy H.264 Fi extension helped bring CPU usage down some more, which could be helpful if multitasking. In PC Mark 10, the system scored a 7094 in the Essentials category and a 4846 in Productivity. It scored a 3 run average of 346 in Cinebench R15, and pulled 28.5 watts from the wall at idle, and 63 under full load. It did all this while staying relatively cool, with the CPU hitting a max delta T of 41 degrees Celsius over ambient, and idled at 11 degrees Celsius over ambient. When comparing this to something like the Intel Pentium J2900 we looked at previously, we can see that the i3 far outperforms the low-powered Pentium, but at the cost of efficiency. Although for normal desktop usage, this thing is by no means power hungry, and the 180 watt power supply should be plenty for this configuration. I thought it would be interesting to see what the CPU and integrated graphics could handle when it comes to light gaming, so I tried out my all-time favorite, Hollow Knight. At 720p, the game was semi-playable with an average frame rate of about 40 frames per second. The frame times weren't great though, and the game could feel pretty stuttery at times, which probably wouldn't be good during a tough boss fight. I also tried Rocket League, but I don't think it could be very competitive with the 30 frames per second average I was getting. I'd be curious to see what this could do with an inexpensive GPU, but that'll have to wait for a later video. I don't think I would go out of my way to spend $40 on this PC, especially without the RAM, but I am genuinely surprised with how well the i3-4160 in it performed. It wasn't a great deal, but I don't think my $40 went to waste. Let me know in the comments if you think otherwise though. I'd like to use this system for something else in the future, but I'm not exactly sure what that is. I'm leaning towards getting an i5 or i7 and an inexpensive graphics card and turning this into a budget gaming slash workstation PC, or maybe a dedicated streaming PC. Or maybe I can just leave it as is and give it to someone to use for school, work, or other basic computing. I think there are a lot of possibilities, and if you have any ideas for what you think this could be used for, let me know in the comments below. If you like this video and would like to see more, maybe hit that subscribe button and check out my channel. A like is also very easy and very helpful. That's about it for this one though, so thanks for watching, stay curious, and I hope to see you in the next one.